Good evening, and welcome to The People Here, Interrogating Indigenous Dispossession of the Land Occupied by Salem State University. My name is Mike Mitchell, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at Salem State, and I'm very pleased to welcome to tonight's program, Jessica Cook, a graduate student here at Salem State, and Professor Kaja Valens from the English Department, also here at Salem State. Jessica, Kaja, good evening. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are looking forward to a, a wonderful presentation. Jessica, I know this is a, a passion project for you. Um, I think our audience is in for a real treat tonight. Thank you. So at this point, I will turn it over to you and I look forward to our conversation. So I think we're just gonna start with some um, quick introductions. Um, so um, Jess, do you want to um, say anything more about yourself other than your your position? <laughs> um, well, my name is Jessica Cook. Um, I am currently a graduate student uh, in English literature here at Salem State. Um, I'm also a four plus one student, which means I recently completed uh, a bachelor's at Salem State, um, also in English literature, and I minored in women's and gender studies. Um, so I'm currently in my last year in my master's program. Um, focusing again a lot on you know gender uh studies but also on ethnic studies particularly uh indigenous literature uh and things adjacent to that i think that's all <laughs> nice and um and um as mike said i am kasia valens i'm a professor in the english department um i teach mostly um american um, ethnic literatures and literatures of the Americas. So, um, and also some um, gender and sexuality studies um, courses in English. Um, and um, one of the courses that I teach is Native American literature. Um, and I've been teaching that um, for about 10 years. And uh, last time I taught the course, we were um, going online for, um, the pandemic and um, Jess was and and thinking about other sort of going online more in in other ways. Um, and Jessica was working with me as um, a pedagogy in a pedagogy internship, um, which means that we were working together, preparing lectures um, and preparing course materials. And so as we were thinking about this class, you know, I said, you know, I think we should start with um, a land acknowledgement um, for a Native American literature class. And we looked around a little bit and realized that there isn't um, a standard land acknowledgement um, that Salem State has. And um, so I said, you know, Jess, will you create a land acknowledgement and for the course? And as Jess started to look into that project, um, we started to have conversations about what is a responsible land acknowledgement? How much information do you need to have? Um, and out of that, um, Jess realized that there's a much larger project um, that needed to be done than a little snippet for the beginning of, of, of a class. Um, and so she took up um, doing a directed study um, that produced this project that she's gonna share. And I am um, very delighted to have um, gotten to advise the project as it went and to see um, it now becoming um, a, a really Jess's own work that she's starting to share um, broadly. So Jess is going to do most of the talking um, and I'm happy to pass it over to her. Thank you. Yeah, this was a project that I um, wasn't really expecting to embark on. Um, you know, as Keisha said, it was a, sort of a, a small element of a, a larger course that we were working on together. Um, but really, in the conversations that we had, we realized the need to really kind of examine and really like interrogate what a land acknowledgement does and what its limitations are and kind of what we can do here at Salem State um, to engage in all of the things that land acknowledgement brings up. Um, so to kind of start out, um, the reason why land acknowledgement really exists, um, native peoples of Turtle Island, um, which is what non-native people call uh, 
or I'm sorry, what non Native people call North and Central America. Um, Native people have long held ceremonies and traditions that acknowledge and thank land and ancestors. Um, so in indigenous worldviews, land is directly related to community and self-identification. Um, to paraphrase Elizabeth Solomon uh, of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog, whose work I engaged with throughout this project and you will see in the exhibit, um, she says that the native relationship to the environment is one in which people are not separate from the land, but rather they are part of the land. So as far as land acknowledgement goes as a contemporary practice, um, this began as a contemporary movement in Canada in the early 2000s, um, kind of as part of what the Canadian government calls uh, truth and reconciliation. So in the beginning, institutions like schools and art museums and sports arenas and government buildings, which are really colonial institutions. Um, in Canada, they would call on Native people to deliver or construct verbal or written statements that recognize the original people of the land um, and their history and their presence. And these land acknowledgments were really powerful and I would say radical. Um, they served as disruptions to events to like fun activities um, that and the alerted non-native people to the ongoing process of colonization. So again, like in the beginning, this was a pretty radical act. Um, but as the practice of land acknowledgement continued in Canada and caught on in the United States and Australia, which are other nations, you know, constructed by colonial projects, um, land acknowledgement became commonly practiced by non-native people. Um, which really distanced, I think, the impact and meaning of what land acknowledgement originally served to do. Um, for this project, I read countless accounts from Native and First Nations academics and tribal groups and leaders and just like regular Indigenous people on social media who more often than not critiqued current land acknowledgement practices as a trend that has become an empty performance. Um, and today land acknowledgement is often, I think rattled off as a perfunctory gesture that needs to just be kind of gotten out of the way before an event or public gathering can start. Um, for example, people also have like email signatures that contain land acknowledgements, you know, so someone within Salem State sends me an email and at the bottom it says this email was sent from the traditional homeland of the Namkiag people. Um, this is a gesture that is rooted in good intentions, but if I see that email signature 10 times a week from my non-native colleague who never talks to me about what it, you know, what that acknowledgement means or how it shapes their work here at the college, there's a sense of repetition and I think disassociation that erases the meaning and the impact of the statement. Um, so this leads to the problem um, that Keisha was getting at, that this project um, that I'm presenting seeks to engage with members of the Salem State community about. Um, I say as an English major, words are immensely powerful um, in using them with care in certain contexts, we can theoretically call attention to honor Native people in a way that resists erasure. Um, words can alert us to injustice. In this case, the injustice of colonial violence and genocide. Um, and words can allow us to engage in discussion of knowledge and ideas um, in profound ways to build relationships and to move towards actions of healing. But the question is, how can we use the words of a land acknowledgement or something else um, that defines the land, you know, the physical place we exist as stolen really from indigenous people? How can we continue to remind ourselves and each other of this fact without engaging in an empty performance that takes all of one minute. Um, how can people be engaged? More specifically, how can students, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, <laughs> community members, um, people you know, in and around Salem State University, 
how can they and we meaningfully engage with our colonial past, present, and future, and operate in ways that are underscored by knowledge of the original people of this land? Um, those are obviously big questions. Um, in my research and engagement with indigenous points of view about land acknowledgement, most of it centered around this notion of moving from performance to in-depth knowledge, and then really importantly, putting that knowledge into action. Um, words are powerful, yes, but it's what you do with these words. It's the action that moves beyond the theoretical into the concrete, um, which is where meaningful change can happen. So all of this is to say what this project is. Um, there are many, many narratives of the people of Namkiag, the people original to the place that we call Salem. Um, distilling these narratives into a single statement, like a two sentence land acknowledgement, ultimately does very little. Um, it offers a simplistic, too easy summary of an immensely complex and tangled history of violence, of resistance to that violence, of pain, of joy, and of survival of a people and a land who cannot be easily summarized. So in this project, I sought to put these many narratives in conversation with one another so that anyone, uh, like a student, an alumnus, a faculty member, a guy who lives in downtown Salem um, could wade into the many facets of this conversation and choose how they want to engage with the many but really forever incomplete uh, stories and facts and estimations that are presented here in this project. So in this project, the narratives of the people of Namkiag are presented primarily in a timeline, which I will show you shortly, that, um, again, I just want to stress, is purposefully incomplete. Um, before European colonists arrived on this land as early as like the 1400s, native communities operated on an oral tradition. Um, they did not have written literature or documents. Stories and information were passed orally. In contrast, the European colonists and then the settler colonists were meticulous records keepers. Um, and because our country in the United States is a colonial project, our society has historically prioritized settler records and accounts as being objectively true, um, which created and creates what is often a single narrative of, you know, what happened and what continues to happen. So in this project, I examined both native and settler accounts about the people of Namkiag, um, about their kin and the Namkiag diaspora to offer what is a compendium of stories that when held together offers an inherently imprecise portrait of a people and a land. So the idea is, um, and I think we can pull up the site now onto the screen, Mike. Um, thank you. The idea is that anyone who visits this digital exhibit has autonomy. Um, the visitor, which is you, which is anybody, can engage with the many narratives here and sit with what is presented. Um, you know, going through the information here, you can think about what questions you have, what is missing, what you are interested in reading more about. Um, you can think about what you want to do with this information. You can, of course, go about your daily life holding some of that knowledge um, of the Namkiag people and the Massachusetts people and their diaspora within you uh, and, you know, do nothing with it, but you can also move to action uh, in various ways, which I think is the most important thing here. Um, we have some suggestions, which I will show you on the exhibit, um, on where to go from here, on how to participate in indigenous-led activism that moves towards 
different decolonization efforts that range from reparations to returning land to native people. Um, I'll underscore that in this project, we offer no certain answers. Um, this is very much a project about questions and the dialogue of question asking, but we do offer avenues for engagement here. So uh, looking at the exhibit here, um, which you can, if you want to kind of follow along here, you can. Um, I think Mike can put the address to the site on the screen. Um, so this is the site, this is the first page that you reach um, that has our graphic here that says the people here and the title interrogating indigenous dispossession of the land occupied by Salem State. Um, and to reiterate, this is about tracing indigenous dispossession specifically to Salem State. Um, this is about our Salem State community and how we can uh, kind of hone in on the details here um, and be personally accountable to a story that is specific to this, this very land where we are as a, an institution. Um, so there's navigation on the right hand screen here and I will definitely not go through everything that is here because we do not have time. Um, and I think Keja might want to pop in and say something. Go ahead, Keja. Yo, so one of the things I, I want to um, say for uh, some context is also as um, there are two parts to the title and I think, you know, just thought really carefully about these. One is the people here to remind um, that this there are indigenous people here um, nearby in this community, maybe in this Zoom call. This is this is a living um, community and a living tradition. And we interact um, as we think about land acknowledgement. We're acknowledging who is still here, who is around us, um, both land and people. And also one of the questions that is particular to um, New England is often um, because there was a lot, there has been a lot of interruption um, and um, not decimation, but interruption. One of the questions, there is a lot of historical information that needs to be um, explored. How was the land dispossessed, right? Um, how was the land occupied? So um, I, I sort of want to um, shape a lot of what Jess's project is doing here um, is tracing that history, um, but I want to remind the, the here part also um, to acknowledge this is not only a historical situation. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's something that I take for granted when talking about this, because we've talked about, you know, together so many times that this project is really underscored by the theory of survivance, um, which is a, a term coined by uh, an indigenous scholar named Gerald Visner. Um, and it's a portmanteau of survival and resistance. And it's really about not talking about Native people as extinct, right? As this historical, you know, back in the past and we are here now. Um, and yeah, Keja is exactly right. This is about a relationship to land and it is specifically about people who are very much here uh, among us in our university community. Um, and all of this is a conversation about building relationships that are very much rooted in the presence. So thank you for that, Keja. Um, so a lot of you know what I just stated is is here in our introduction. Um, there is a page that explains some of the terminology that we use throughout this project. Um, things that might be useful today are, are the ways that we use indigenous, native, and original people interchangeably here. Um, Nam Kiag, for people who do not know, um, refer to the original people of the land that is today known as Salem, but also Beverly, Danvers, Peabody, and Marblehead. Um, so this page is useful as far as the language that is used in, I will skip to now, um, our timeline. This is really the heart of the project. Um, let me let it load. Okay. And, so and while this it's is loading, I just want to, we talked about wanting to um, make sure that we also acknowledge um, Hannah Drew, who did um, 
all of the technical um, site building um, that we have here. Um, and um, Hannah um, graduated um, and is uh, um, off doing other things. Um, but the the sort of as we look at the timeline, that those building parts are um, are Hannah's pieces. Yes. Absolutely. This would just be text in a Word document if we didn't have Hannah on this project. So she was invaluable um, and a wonderful supporter. So Hannah, if you're watching, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to click here onto the full screen version of the timeline. It's it's best viewed here um, just because of the way that it kind of lays horizontally. Um, so the first image um, here and one that is also on the main header of the site is a photo that I took at Forest River Park, um, which is located across from North Campus where um, Salem Pioneer Village is. So part of this project for me was like walking around Salem and other nearby towns and thinking about and physically being a part of the land. Um, I live in Ipswich, which is the ancestral land of the Agawam people. And one of the many points that I think is important to understand uh, in, in kind of going through this project is that the idea of a tribe or a nation was an organizational method applied to Native communities by the colonists initially. Um, the colonists used those terms to make sense of the people who they interacted with. Of course, tribe and nation are now very important uh, for the identity of indigenous people today. Um, but you know, when we're talking about the original people um, of Agawam, they didn't think of their communities as being divided into tribes and nations the way that we might think of it today. Um, People like the Agawam and the Namkiag and the Wampanoag, for example, were communities where membership was fluid and ever-changing. So people in these communities were not relegated to their groups. Um, so although this project speaks to the Salem State community and about the people of Namkiag, as you'll see in this timeline, um, the scope of it is a little bit wider than that. And it connects indigenous dispossession directly to the land where our campus is located, but also on the land where I live in Ipswich or you know, people in Gloucester live. Um, it, it's larger than just Salem here. Um, so there is something like 75 slides in this timeline. Um, I should say here too that we have peppered our email address throughout this exhibit, and we encourage anybody who is interested to get in touch with us if you'd like to contribute to this project. Um, this is a living project that um, we hope to continue and add to many different voices. Um, so maybe Mike can put this on the screen, but it's the people here project at gmail.com. Um, but as I was saying, there are more slides here than I could ever possibly go through in an hour. So I've just selected a few to give you an idea of what is here. Um, so the timeline starts around 20,000 years ago, which is our starting point. Um, I think it's important to underscore that there's so much that we do not know about the people of Namkiag. Um, so again, these are glimpses. These are some narratives. These are a partial portrait. Um, one of the things that we do know is at the end of the last ice age, um, gl gl glacial drift, which is hard for me to say, glacial drift um, moved ice to carve hills and form waterways across Turtle Island. Um, there are indigenous um, creation myths that point to this point at the end of the last ice age as um, stories of how this area, which indigenous people call Dawnland, that's the, the Northeast here, um, of how it was created. So for example, the Algonquin people of present day Canada to the North of us tell a story of the great hare who once lived in a world made only of water. With the help of other animals, the great hare finally attains a grain of sand, which grows into an ever-expanding mass of land, and that creates Turtle Island. 
Um, so oral histories like this, along with archaeological findings, are evidence of a human history in Dawnlan that spans tens of thousands of years and predates our timeline, I'm sure, quite a bit. Um, so you can go through the timeline with these arrows here. Um, this is in chronological order. You can also scroll along here. And one of the things um, that you will notice is down here when we get to particularly the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, you see that the timeline looks very piled up and overlapping. Um, it is a lot to look at, and it's frankly a little difficult to navigate here. Um, this is purposeful. In terms of the design of the exhibit software, this happened because our timeline is so long. Um, it spans from 18,000 BC to like the year 6,000 in the future. Um, this is to underscore the fact that, as Keja and I were saying before, Native people have always and will always be here. Um, there isn't a beginning point and an ending point. So for the piled up section, you know, here in the 15, 16, 17, 1800s, um, this offers a bit of, I think, visual representation of the interruption of indigenous life ways that uh, colonialism, that the settlers and their descendants created. So if you don't click through all of these, uh, it's hard to navigate. It's hard to just pick out one point, which is purposeful and meaningful, I think. Um, but I'm going to try to do that to get you to a further point. Okay, so I'm still clicking. It kind of forces you to go through this way. <laughs> So one of the things I am, I think, proudest of in this timeline is that I was able to trace the story of a particular Namkiag family through the 1600s and 1700s, um, So, which is really right at the point of settler colonial invasion and beyond. Um, this lineage begins with Nana Pashamit, who was uh, Sockum, which is a symbolic leader of the Pawtucket people. Um, the first wave of settler colonists arrived around 1616 and Nana Peshamit died in 1619, which is here. Um, it was at this point that his wife, who was known as the Massachusetts Sungsqua, which is another leadership role, took over her husband's responsibilities. So this is a statue in Arlington that depicts the Massachusetts Sunk Squaw. Um, she was really important to forging diplomatic relationships between native people and colonists. Um, she negotiated alliances and land agreements with the colonists and protected her people from encroach encroachment. Um, and over decades, she appointed her sons to do some of that same diplomatic hospitality and work. So in the timeline, we're able to follow the Sungsqua and her children, particularly Wenapoikin, um, who oversees Namkiag. So this happens around 1620, um, when he is most likely a child or teenager. So if you continue with the timeline, you'll see that he, among many other narratives that are woven in here, Wenapoikin engages in legal, legal battles over land um, that was taken through coercion or just land theft from his family. Um, he fights against the English in the King Philip's War. He is eventually enslaved by the English after the war and sent to Barbados for about 10 years. Um, and then he finally returns home to his family in Donland before he dies in 1684. So being able to trace Wenapoikin and the Sunk Squaw and other family members, I think 
gives visitors of this exhibit a chance to really kind of view what happened here in a very personal lens um, to be able to connect this to individual people. Um, another aspect of this project that I think is worth pointing out is the inclusion of deeds. I can get to one. And I, I'll, as 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 Jess is getting there, I, one of the other things that I think this the story um, of Nana Pashamit, um really helps to make sense of is um, the con how it is, the connections among the different tribes and how it is that when we think about saying um, Namkyag, some 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 folks talk about um, Salem as being the land of the Namkyag, some people talk about it as being the land of the Pawtucket, and some people talk about it as being the land of the Massachusetts. Um, and what Jess has done is to show very clearly how those are all true um, and they are not conflicting. <laughs> Yes, and that is actually, um, I think, how we, one of the aspects of how we began on this project is, you know, looking into what historians say happened here then. Um, there was all of this information that we at first thought was conflicting. Um, and then, as, as Keja is saying, uh, we realized that these are all true at once. Um, and in weaving together these narratives here, I, I hope that we, um, that we present that well. So here, this is the 1684 deed to the town of Salem, um, which includes signatures by a number of the people related to the descendants of Nana Pashamit and the Sunk Squaw. Um, so again, this points to that lineage here. Um, so we're running low on time, so I'm just going to show one more point on this timeline here. Um, Going into the 1800s is when we are able to connect the land here uh, to Salem State. Um, so the Salem Normal School um, was deeded in 1854. Uh, and this is the original deed to the Normal School, which is originally located in downtown Salem. Um, the building was previously a registry of deeds, which is kind of ironic. Um, and the land was valued at $5,000. Um, the timeline continues on. And in 1896, the normal school moves to Salem State's current location. Um, so where North Campus is at Lafayette Street and um, Loring Ave. As of now, I was only able to find written historical documents, which again are a colonial construct that date to 1797, where a man named uh, Thomas Mason deeded two parcels of land to a couple for uh, named Christopher and Mary Osgood, which is an, the colonial Salem family name for $20. It is unclear how Mason first acquired the land. For example, did he or his father uh, or his grandfather purchase it from the Namkiag? We don't know. Um, but because this is a living project, this is something that we would love for people to continue to make this connection to further explain how Salem State came to occupy land and at one point, you know, effectively usurp that land that becomes Salem State from the Namkiag. Um, so I'm going to exit out of the timeline now. Um, and just to show you what else is here before we, I think, move into a question portion. Um, after the timeline, there is a page that we call Beyond Land Acknowledgement. Um, as I explained in the beginning, uh, there's information here about land acknowledgement, um, its limitations, a lot of which we have already discussed. Um, here we include a list of resources for native-led organizations and activist movements. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, we would love for people to contribute more to this. Um, for example, there's the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness, which is located in Danvers. Um, 
there's a North American Indian Center of Boston. Um, they have their own, you know, issues that in affect indigenous people in this immediate area that they are currently addressing. Um, so all of these are clickable. There are resources um, on social media too that are also really valuable. And finally, we have our page that we're calling Salem State University Land Acknowledgement. Um, one thing that I really want to highlight here is this video that I encourage everyone to watch. Um, this is a land acknowledgement and just a, a message from Elizabeth Solomon of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Um, the Massachusetts tribe are the present day and have always been the stewards of this land. Um, the Massachusetts Sung Squaw was a, a Massachusetts leader and part of the Namkiag. Um, Elizabeth Solomon delivered this message last year on Indigenous Peoples Day, and she did it for Salem Pioneer Village. Um, so you can click here and watch it here, or you can watch it on YouTube. Um, I think it's especially important to have an Indigenous voice talking about land acknowledgement, um, delivering a land acknowledgement, and you know, speaking today in the present tense here in this project. Um, here we have a kind of preamble to what eventually leads into an abbreviated land acknowledgement. Um, in this project, we understand that sometimes there are circumstances where people at this university are going to want a statement that is abbreviated. Um, and as much as we hope with this project that people can, uh, you know, particularly students and other community members, that they will do the work here and look into the questions that are posed, the narratives that are woven together here. Um, we hope that that kind of engagement is taking place, but we also have a brief statement here for those people who are looking for it. Um, and other than that here, we have a bibliography that includes some of the sources used, particularly in the timeline. Um, this is a great research for further reading. Um, we, there are some wonderful books and articles um, that can really give you even more information that we're that go beyond just this project. And I think with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Keisha. Yeah, and so um, if you have um, questions, we tried to save a nice amount of time for some discussion. So please, um, um, Mike just gave some instructions, please um, sub po post any questions and we'll, we'll be really happy to talk about them. Looking at the bibliography also um, reminded me to say what's not on the bibliography because it was still um, being written at the time and we'll, we'll add it in um, soon is um, a piece by um, Dr. Rupika Rissam who also um, helped to advise this project um, about um, particularly universities. Um, she's looking, the piece is looking um, nationwide, but universities and how universities can deal with thinking about um, their own responsibility to um, the land and the people um, that um, that continue to be um, its inheritors and, and protectors. Um, another thing that um, I was thinking um, that I that is really one of my favorite parts about this project is that question of um, and there because there's a big gap the question of how Salem State. Um, came to occupy Namkiag land. And one of the one of the parts um, that is in there that I think is worth mentioning is that, so there was a deed um, of, so, so Salem, um, the Namkiag was deeded to the English. Um, and then there's a big question about what the conversation was about the term of that deed. Right. So what was the conversation about how long that agreement was expected to be? Um, and that's one of the places. So one of the ways so, so I think folks often think, well, but Salem was um, given up. Right. So that it's not exactly stolen land, although it may be coerced. Um, but there is there's a lot of, of there are a lot of moments of confusion. One, how long was that? to that was to the English. And so then what happened when with the American Revolution and then what happened when Massachusetts became a state? There are all these moments where there are and, and you find 
um, some information about this that Jess has included in the project where you find these moments where indigenous people are saying, hey, time's up, right? Like it's it's our, it, th this land is, um, is no longer yours. This wasn't yours forever, um, right? Things have changed and, um, and yet um, the land did not go back. Um, right. Especially um, there's a moment in the timeline that I mentioned really briefly with Wenapoikin, who um, at some point in the 1650s spends an incredible amount of money and time going to the um, the settler courts, the English courts, trying to essentially get back the land that he and his brothers um, deeded or perhaps didn't deed to the English. Um, so when you think about this is happening in a court who is clearly on the side of the English, um, they're ruling against him. There's a, a moment where he is putting up more land for collateral in order to get back some of that land, um, which is it's it's really upsetting to read. <laughs> a lot of it here is upsetting. Um, and I think too, with the deeds that we've included here, especially, um, something that surprised me was a lot of the deeds that are um, available for public record. I got all of these from the Essex County uh, deeds. A lot of them are deeds that were created after the fact. So there'll be one that said, you know, in 1634, the land to Ipswich was deeded. Um, this was written in 1692, you know, they're recounting an event. So it, there's, there's not the evidence there that we would expect. Um, and it creates this narrative, again, that is told from one specific point of view. Um, so there's a question here, I'm gonna read it. Were there any stories or revelations that surprised you as you embarked on this project? Jess, do you wanna? <sighs> yes. Um, I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this presentation today because I, you know, I felt like it was a question someone was going to ask. And I don't, there were so many things. Um, I feel like, you know, Kasia and I and and Hannah and and Dr. Rizom, we we met every week and there were so many things that I would come and say, can you believe this? Look at this, look at this, look at how these things overlap or or don't. Um, we had so many great conversations about the information that we came across. I think what was, I don't know about most surprising, but perhaps most impactful for me was really considering as a student of English literature whose life is words, um, really considering how the language we use is uh, directly shaped by colonial constructs. Um, like what I brought up before about, you know, the idea of what a tribe is and what a nation is. Um, that's language we use all the time. Um, and it again, it is really important to many indigenous people as for community and personal identification, but that language comes from the colonists who interrupted a way of life that didn't, call for that kind of organization. Um, and in the same regard, the way that the colonists, when you know doing their records keeping, when writing about the people who they were encountering here, um, really put a patriarchal framework on the people who they encountered. Um, they believed that only men were, you know, quote unquote, leaders of these tribes um, that they encountered. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, and we know that too, that, you know, gender with indigenous people is not a binary. It's not man or woman. Um, and that's something we address on our terminology page. So really, I think all of this is to say, challenging myself to think outside of constructs that I thought that I had already challenged in my life. Um, this kind of brought to light to me that, God, it is so incredibly hard to break free from these worldviews, even if we try to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and Asia, what what was surprising yeah. for you? So what I would say that one of the pieces that was really surprising um, to me was um, understanding better how 
um, people of Namkiag um, and the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts were sold into slavery in Barbados. That part, I, I had some knowledge about it, but I, I now understand that much better. So understanding that um, when we talk about indigenous people um, being decimated, it's not only that indigenous people were killed, but often that they were moved. And that, so Jess often talks about um, the people of Namkyag and their diaspora. Um, that is a big diaspora that ex extends um, often into slavery and then the other part that there was traffic back and forth, right? So think about that colonial um, space. There was lots of traffic back and forth, both um, by colonizers, but also by the colonized, by indigenous people and by enslaved people between Barbados and New England so that so that people could come and go and having that regional connection um, is is really important in terms of thinking about sort of where is um, the diaspora um, and how how are they um, how is that diaspora um, continued um, and and come and gone um, from this place. So I yeah, think and, a, and and there there are now um, there are now gatherings of. Um, Indigenous people from the Caribbean and Indigenous people um, in New England um, who are who have who have made some of those reconnections. Um, yeah, um, absolutely, so and that, that, that reminds me. I was going to say too. I see someone asked a question. Um, did you come across any information that changed your initial perceptions of the timeline or landscape? Um, thinking particularly of you know the timeline. Um, and I guess we should mention indigenous worldviews of time are non-linear. Um, so we put this in a linear timeline really just for an organizational framework, just like the colonists. Um, but we we kind of felt like we had to do that. But um, it is absolutely a colonial framework. Um, but one of the things as far as the timeline that was surprising to me, I think, is that we talk so much about settler colonialism beginning at a very specific point in the beginning of the 17th century. Um, you know, when uh, Samuel D. Champlain arrived on the tip of what we call Gloucester now, I think that was in 1604, um, we consider that contact. Um, but there was, uh, there were colonists arriving on these shores for probably at least a hundred years before that. Uh, um, not settler colonists in particular, but colonists coming here for trade, to seek out resources. And as Keisha just brought up, to enslave native people. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence of, you know, the in the 1500s and perhaps even the late 1400s, um, indigenous people being enslaved and brought back to Europe. And as Keisha is saying, and then returning here to Dawnland, which I thought was particularly interesting to kind of stretch our idea of when all of this started um, is far before that. And, and to the question of um, our initial per perceptions of timeline and landscape, one of the things, you know, that Jess talked about starting um, the exhibit with um, the, the picture of Forest Park. And I think um, I think for both of us, I think we've talked about this, but I'll, I'll speak for myself. One of the things is just um, taking the time as I walk around campus, as I walk around Salem, um, looking at the rocks, looking at the hills, um, and and remembering what a living landscape this is, um, and that um, these are um, that that some of the many of the rock formations, in fact, even that we think of as stone walls, um, probably are built over and around um, uh, rock formations that were part of. Um, uh, um, the charting, sort of making astro astrological um, um, charting, um, and and so just that that sense of um, how much we can look and find right around us um, and continue to be connected to. 
Yeah. Um, and anyone who goes in and looks at the timeline, there's a couple of photographs in there um, of a site in Gloucester that um, a wonderful friend of the English department named Christine Draper um, brought me on a little field trip to look at these um it's it's called Pole Hill in Gloucester, and it's these massive boulders that are arranged in a very specific way that is an astrological formation um, dating to centuries ago. Um, that was part of this project that was really special that, like you're saying, really connected me to this living history and present um, that, yeah, it was just, it was a really special experience. And there's some photos in there that I think are quite nice. Um, and Jess, there's a question up above. I think you spoke to this a little bit, but you might say um, more about how this project connects your focus as an English major and how that informed the project. Yeah, I think that's such a great question because it's something I asked myself a lot when embarking on this project. Um, I mean, this started, as Keja said in the beginning, um, as part of a Native American literature course. Um, so that was logical there. Um, and then the more we started talking about this project, I kind of, I said a few times, um, should I be doing this? You know, my kind of specialty is, is to be an English student. Um, shouldn't a historian or a geographer be doing this kind of work? And we had a lot of conversations about, you know, as someone who is trained as a reader, um, you know, I've spent the last five years of my life learning how to be I wouldn't say an expert, but to be a great reader, um, that I think that's really what this project has been about. Um, wading into the archives, wading into current conversations, and reading really critically and understanding how narratives can act as palimpsests, um, how stories pose questions, how we can engage with those stories, and really what literature, whether it's nonfiction or fiction or storytelling orally, um, what that can do and what the possibilities are. Um, you know, I was nervous to feel like I wasn't qualified to do something like this, but English is part of the larger umbrella of the humanities. And what is a project like this, if not humanism? And, and I think, you know, one of the other things that um, we keep talking about and, and noticing is just how much our language informs our current, the way that we even talk about this project. Um, so really thinking carefully about how we tell the story. And, and one of the things that um, we've talked about a lot is just who are the, when we say we, who are the we who we're referring to, right? Um, and yes. and I think that's one of the big, one of the big, you know, pieces, as Jess was saying, that attention to language, um, that, um, that this coming from an English studies and a literary studies perspective really makes us think about storytelling, but also language. And I would say very much this project has made me much more aware of the different ways that um, I use we and community um, and the ways that, you know, I think part of what, what one of the things that we definitely struggled with thinking about how to talk about this project is um, that um, in, you know, Jess and I are not um, indigenous to this land. Um, we're not part of any of these indigenous communities and a lot of our audience isn't, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the majority population um, of Salem State is not indigenous. And at the same time, um, this is very much a project that is also um, addressing indigenous people um, and be trying to be in conversation um, with the different ways that that we can only speak from our positions and that we are trying um, constantly to be speaking with um, and in conversation with other positions. Yeah, absolutely. So much of this project is just about connections and relationships and kind of what we do with that. And also, I think in regard to being a student of English, um, 
I learned a lot about the limitations of the English language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I talked about how I engaged with both indigenous and non-native, you know, sources, um, academics, historians, uh, regular people. Um, and all of that is in English. So as far as, you know, the information that is out there, um, there's a lot that I personally, as a non-Indigenous person, can't access. And I think, you know, there's the wonder of language, but there's also the limitation of it and kind of where we go from that and also how we honor that too, um, I think was a big part of that project. And and hopefully opening up. I mean, I think, you know, when I say looking at the being able to walk around and see um, starting to be able to read the rocks, right, um, that there are some ways that um, there may very there are there are writings, there are versions of this of these stories. There are some of these stories um, that I think um, are written in ways that we are maybe just learning how to read um, that we, Jess and I, right there. Um, and, and that um, at Salem State, those haven't been languages um, and ways of storytelling that um, have been taught. Um, and it's possible there's, there's, a, there's a space to start learning how to hear stories from other sources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are, like so good on time. We were supposed to, we were supposed to be done at seven, and it is six fifty eight. So um, I think um, I really want to invite, as Jess said, um, invite folks to um, send um, information, send questions to um, um, the people here. Project at gmail .com. Um, Please um, visit the. Um, the site um you've got the the bitly it's also um it's hosted through um the salem state um library digital commons um so um that's also a space that you can find it um and um i also just want to say this is in addition to learning about the material um it's a moment that i just celebrate as um an English professor and as someone who interacts with students and alumni, um, a moment of getting to um, be a student of someone who started as a student of mine and, and I end as a student of hers. Um, and that's a fantastic joy. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, Keisha, for all of your support. Um, this has been a wonderful project that we're going to keep working on. And thank you too to Mike for hosting us, who is yeah. invisible right now, but I know he's there. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, attending tonight. We are so happy to have you. And yes, please send any questions or comments to us. Um, we would love to engage more about this. <laughs>